The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders of XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team, and today I'm here with Michael Curry. Michael is a founder and advisor at better financial planning. Uh, He's been at it in his business for about five years and in advice for a bit over a decade. Michael, thanks for joining us, mate. Thank you for having me. Mate, I'm keen to talk a a bit about some of the things that you're focused on today and and sort of how you've gone about building your business. But I thought a good place to start is if we could just maybe talk us through your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, well, um, I started off as an advisor just over 10 years ago and I was working for my friend's practice and started my own journey as my own advisor at my own practice about five and a half years ago, as you said. And it's in that five years, it's been, um, it's I would say it's been a bit of a journey um, professionally um, and even as a business owner to work more towards being the advisor or having the business that suits not just my family, but also suits me as a person. When I first started as an advisor, I would probably say that my main goal was to impress others um, and to, to impress clients. You know, that was my main priority for the first year or two. And I think that's like anyone that starts off in any career, their the, the goal is to, you know, they feel like they need to prove something to, to everyone else. But um, over the years, it's gotten to a point where I'm still trying to impress Clients, of course, don't get me wrong. Um, our job is to, to show them who we are and to demonstrate our knowledge and our capabilities. But it's been more about me not being too, you could say, self-conscious about showing clients who I am um, and as a person and just being as raw as possible with them. And coming to that realization, I think, has improved conversations with clients and it's given me a lot more clarity about the type of advisor that I want to be and the type of impact that I want to have on the life of my clients. Yeah, it's super interesting. And I think like I started in a fairly traditional financial advice, money management company. And um, I think like a lot of traditional businesses that we sort of like, it used to be in, in my opinion that like finance or financial advice is like a secret source and, um, you know, it was only the super duper professionals and you had to wear this suit and tie and, um, you know, be like a robotic, I suppose, in um, what you did. But it seems like, like a lot of industries, I suppose, that people are recognizing that you can be be who you are, like everybody's people at the end of the day. And, um, you know, people that are professionals, you've got this expertise in a particular area, but you're still a human being. So, you know, for, for me, I, I dropped the suits a, a long time ago and I found that our clients, that they they appreciate us being who we are. We can still have a joke and um, uh, muck around with them, but know when it's time to do serious work that we're serious about how we go about it. Yeah. 
Definitely. And and for me, I think I've I've always hated tie. I've actually I think I've worn a tie three times in my life. Um, partly because I don't know how to do one up. But for me, it's like, for example, when I first became an advisor, another advisor said to me, you have to have a nice watch because clients look at your watch. I'm like, oh, wow, I need a nice watch. So I actually went and bought literally my first watch I've ever had, I've ever bought. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean, I now love watches. So, and that's, I've only got a couple at the moment, but I, now I love watches because I've got a fascination with them. But my point is that that's the extent yep. that I went to at the start. Um, not that I've ever been yeah. a fake person, but I just felt like I, I have to do this. If I don't do this, people won't take me seriously. And, mm. um, and then again, like, as I said, it took a couple of years to sort of just realize that I just need to be me. And um, I can't ever walk into a meeting unless I was fully shaved, for example, you know, whereas now I look like an alleged terror suspect half the week. So it's, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's been interesting, but it just, yeah, uh, it, I can relate to what you said, Ben, as well, because we can then just become people and that's what our clients want us to be. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think, like five years into business, what have been the biggest changes? What have been the biggest shifts for you? I would say it's been, first of all, efficiency. So just embracing technology um, because it was it was always me initially. I, I had to do that to be more efficient. Um, but secondly, trying to minimize double ups in everything that we do from a um, compliance point of view and from a technology point of view as well, just to be more efficient um and secondly i would say it's 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 been that journey of working out what type of clients we want to work with the most um clients that give me energy um clients that you know i could, I could have a barbecue with them on the weekend if i wanted to um that that type of relationship mm, and i think both of those are interesting points but how did you go about your niching i sat down in a room um it was with um uh, glenn uh, a guy called glenn he was our like our licensee, he was our regional manager type of thing. And we sat down in a room and we I basically put all my clients out on this table and printed out a whole list, a couple of lists, and highlighted the clients that I like working with. And then I sat back and worked out which of these clients, or what do these clients all have in common? Um, and from there, I worked out they were all couples. Literally, they were all couples. Um, saying that it was hard because I've got clients that are single who I do love working with as well. Don't get me wrong, but it was that fun. I found that I think it was the top 20 clients. I put them in a list of just those that I love the most, literally. And I worked out they were all couples. Yep. And then from there, I worked out that that's who I need to start targeting um, because a not just, I don't just not just because I love working with them, but I've got a wife, I've got three children, um, Elias, Marie, and Joseph, and I could relate to their their struggles. I could relate to what they're going through in their life, whether it's whether they've just gotten married or they've just gotten together or whether, you know, it's five, ten years later down the track. I just found mm. that they're, they're the people that I was going to have the biggest impact on life-wise. Well, I find that with, with couples in particular, there's a lot a lot of things, like especially for people that are having kids, that it's like, you, you know, there's different stages of, of that. You're planning to get married. You're planning to start a family. You start a family. You've got the daycare stuff. Then you've got the schooling stuff. Then you've got all of the things that sit around, you know, upsizing and uh, all of those things that there's a lot of a lot of opportunities for our clients to be making smarter decisions and doing better. Um, and they're, they're big decisions. And as you know, I don't need to tell you, but uh, making sure that particularly through those years where you're having kids, you know, income goes down, expenses go up, that what you need to do to make sure you're in the best position on the other side of that is to to invest as much as you can, but do it in a way that doesn't make you compromise on the lifestyle side of things. And I know for our clients, they get a lot of support, for, you know, a lot of peace of mind with that decision making and, and get some good results as well. Um, let me ask what you, so you've determined that you you enjoy working with couples and, and couples, with, you know, uh, working with families and stuff. Did you change then your, your services or what you're doing or did you just, you know, uh, yeah. How, how did you, how did you sort of double down on that? It was not much had changed, to be honest. It was just, I think, my, my energy, um, the, the type of uh, my, our marketing, for example. So um, our website, um, the, the imagery on our website, the wording on our website, the social media content that I was putting out was more around couples and families. Uh, the, uh, the podcast that I started a few years ago 
is targeted literally towards couples. And the topics are about couples, you know, some are money related, some are, one was about choosing school for your kids where I interviewed a, you know, a, a, someone that's worked in education for nearly 20 years. I, one was, you know, about, I interviewed the president of the National um, Beekeeping Association about keeping native bees in your backyard because that's something that, you know, most couples probably care about. So I just focused the topics towards that. And f for me, the bonus of doing that where these these are things that I actually cared about. So it's not like I was um, targeting, I don't know, engineers and I was talking about the different ways of building a bridge. That's probably the worst example <laughs> I could give. But, um, but I was talking about things that I actually cared about, you know, things that got me excited, the things that I wanted to learn about. Uh, and that just makes it so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And with the, the other piece that you mentioned and, you know, you three kids, which, you know, hats, hats off to you. I, I uh, used to think I wanted more than three kids, but when we had the second one, I realized how full on it was. And uh, now I'm sort of second guessing myself, but you mentioned at the start that you, you do your work in a way that allows you to balance your, you know, lifestyle, family commitments uh, around your work. How, how have you tackled that? It's, um, it's just been about the way I schedule my appointments. So it's, um, we, I schedule my appointments literally during school hours. I can do the school drop off, pick up the kids in the afternoon, spend time with them after school. Um, and then normally Monday to Thursday, I'll do it for two or three hours at night, um, working from home. And the, the benefit, that, benefit of that is for me personally, first of all, I work well at night. I don't know why I just do. Um, and secondly, uh -huh. I'm, I'm sort of there for my kids. Um, I was having a conversation with someone a while ago and he was telling me that, you know, well, kids are, you know, up until they become teenagers, they, they want to spend time with you. Um, after that, they don't even want uh -huh. to their sports day. So <laughs> it's, and that was sort of my thing. I was like, okay, well, I mean, it's, yeah, I could, money's money, but at the end of the day, as long as you're earning enough and you're providing and um, you're creating something, if you could make it fit around a lifestyle, you know, as you know, spending time with kids or friends or family or, you know, partners, you can't really put a price on that. So I just made it work towards that. And it, to be honest, it actually suited the business because, because I was working with couples, most couples work nine to five. So telling them, Hey, I can do a seven o'clock zoom meeting is so valuable to them because it's like, wow, yeah. okay, that, that works really well. Um, especially professionals that are busy, um, seven o'clock at night suits me because kids are in bed and, um, I can pop into the office and do a few hours um, on a meeting um, suits them because they'll normally sort their kids out before then as well. And it's, it's sort of work with that. Again, I think it's because I was I'm working and I'm targeting couples and I can relate to that situation. If I was targeting um, people that worked shift work, oh, no, that's probably a bad example, but if somebody worked nonstop during the week, um, and could only do weekends, I wouldn't be able to work with that type of client, for example. Mm, yeah, and I I get the, the, you know, your comment there around, um, uh, you know, team and growing that to, to support you and the hesitation around doing that initially. I know for me personally, I did exactly the same. Like when I started the business, it was just me. It was me for about a year. Then I, I roped in my now wife. We worked together, just the two of us, for two and a half years before um, bringing on uh, uh, a t uh, any team members because I was reluctant to have the what I saw as sort of that obligation to um, to to other team and and being a manager and all of that sort of stuff. How did that sort of come together for you, and what was the what was the tipping point to make you realize that you needed to go down that path, and and then what happened from there? The tipping point for me was reaching capacity to to, to the point where you know I've signed up this many clients for the month so far. Um, and I found myself doing basic admin tasks that I know I shouldn't be doing, you know, tasks that I know someone else can do, I should say, and working. And honestly, it hats off to, to XY, um, to this podcast show. I've learned so much from it. Um, on that note, I've never been too embarrassed to ask for help from anyone, um, literally anyone. Um, worst case, they're just going to say no. And I've never been too embarrassed to, explain my issues to people, to, to other professionals, or other advisors, if I feel like um, I can be doing better. Um, and yeah, and I've, and I've always had an open mind to, to listening to podcasts like this and getting little 
you know, as Emily would say, nuggets of gold, but just little ideas and things like, yes, I need to do that. And just writing notes down um, and just cha- every week changing something in it. Mm. Um, so, so f- for me, the tipping point I think was, yeah, just not having time and just sitting there and like doing file notes for three hours and be like, I could have seen a client in this time, you know, and, but, but instead I've had to rebook that client for two weeks from now, which is the next time I could see them. And it, that just made no sense at all. And everyone said this to me that once you get, when I was obviously, obviously before I took on a staff member, I was talking to friends and family and all that. And um, th- they all said, once you have someone there, you can't live without them. You know, you, you'll, you'll wonder why it took so long to, to have someone to, yeah. to, have a, to have a staff member. Yeah. And what have you done from a process perspective to support that and, and make sure that it was coming together in, in the right way? It was, I think for, for the first, when I decided I needed a staff member, um, I had a pen and a notepad and a pen next to me at the computer for about three months. And every time I did something, which I hated, I wrote it down. And every time <laughs> I did something, which I think someone else could do, I wrote it down. And then I ended up summarizing the list and being like, okay, of these things, what can, what, what can I really get someone else to do? Um, and I just passed it off. I just made that list from there. And secondly, um, before I had any staff members, I created workflows and systems and processes um, on my end, pretending I had different staff members, if that made sense, just for the whole client financial planning process from start to finish. And literally from sending off an authority form to calling five days later to ask, you know, do the, to do the research for the super fund. And um, when the implementation is complete, calling the client and letting them just basic things, but literally documenting it. And then when yeah. I did get a staff member, it just became a lot easier because they could sort of slot into this part. And I could say, okay, this, this, this is your part here. This is my part. Again, it wasn't perfect and it still isn't. And every week we're like uh, realizing that there's something we forgot to do. But my point is it was just, it, it, yeah, and it's this isn't my idea. I can't take credit for it. I don't know who I borrowed or stole it off, um, but it's just something that I heard. And I was like, yes, that's that makes sense. Uh, it absolutely does. And uh, our business coach is big on that as well. And all, also um, the just he had uh, – our business coach talks about like red time and green time where you look back in your calendar and go, what are the things that, that bring you energy that you, that you get jazzed in doing and what are the things that drain energy from you? And um, yeah. And then, you know, figuring out what the, what are the most important things or the most valuable things to, to get off your plate. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty liberating exercise. I think regardless of what, what point you are in your career or if you're a business owner in that journey as well, um what i'm keen to hear like mainly from a selfish perspective i suppose but like what's your biggest hack for um for team for for either in managing them or in in managing you know and uh, work workload workflow the biggest hack like it's um honestly it's it's no magic recipe at all um it's it it literally every tuesday we just have a a meeting or I mean we have meetings in between but we have a staff meeting every Tuesday we look at what we've how the week's been what we think we can improve on um, I'm always asking um, staff members if there's something that they think we can be doing differently um, honestly n- literally no magic formula um, just I think it's just improving and never feeling like things are perfect I think and I think if, if if we have that mentality if anyone has that mentality as a business owner they'll just continue to improve um, compared to being like, oh no, we've got our systems, things are going well, and you could, you know, the, the machine's well oiled. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think the the one of the things that always attracted me to advice is that you know the rules are always changing around advice and advice strategies. But I think business and business conditions and um, you know teams are always changing as well. So it means that there's always there's always something more. I think you're probably doing pretty well if you think you're you're at at that perfection point, um, you know, in, in the environment that we're in today. Michael, you mentioned to me just when we were chatting a little bit offline that recently you've been focused on the conversations that you're having with your clients and having deeper conversations. Talk to me a little bit more uh, about how that's happened for you. So f- for me, I've always been a a people person. Um, it, it's in my DNA. I've got an obsession with helping people, like li- literally, like before I even knew what an advisor was, if I could help someone, I just didn't shut up about it. Um, and it's just been something that I've always wanted to do. And when I used to sit with clients, when I first started, I'd sit there and talk to them. I'd first spend the first 20 minutes talking about what type of holiday they want to take. And 
over the years with all the compliance and all the th technical things that we need to do as advisors and the things that we have to be really good at and the time constraints that I started to have, a lot of that got lost where it was more about the process and what I need to do, what's next. Um, I still cared about the client, don't get me wrong. And we still had discussions like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't as deep anymore as it used to be. And um, I engaged um, a, a business advisor slash coach, um, Baz Gardner is his name, um, about a year ago. And after listening to some of his work and seeing what he does and something he's taught me is to, ha you know, he calls it how to become an exceptional advisor. And a lot of that is about having deeper conversations with clients and not just talking about money, um, spending the first half of the meeting talking about what that person wants in life. Are they happy with their life? Um, do they need clarity in their life? Um, what's, what is happening, um, work-wise, uh, relationship-wise, uh, mentally? Um, I mean, we're not psychologists, but I mean, as you know, when we talk about money, all these other things come in, like the relationship people have with money, um, any conflict in a relationship when it comes to money, um, and even just not just looking at the figures and the, the budgeting and the savings and the superannuation, the life insurance and the estate planning and the investments, but looking at the goals on a much deeper level. Like for, for example, um, my last, probably one of my biggest, uh, one of my most, you know, you could say fluffy stories recently was I had a client that has a business and every year we've been you know, doing the financial planning side of things, doing what we do, um, doing a, a pretty good job. And he, he can see that and he appreciates it. Um, and he's moved forward financially as a person. Um, but I had a discussion with him about six months ago about his business saying, listen, I don't think the amount of time you're putting into your business is worth what you're earning. Um, and now, as simple as that sounds, it was a hard thing to say to this person because he's spent a really long time building his business. But I literally just critiqued every single part of the business that I could and everything that he was doing. And he literally just admitted to me that, yeah, well, I mean, I've actually lost um, I've lost my my vibe. I've, I've lost the excitement I used to have. Um, I'm over it. And he thought his solution was going to be to go and hire more staff. But that was only going to make the problem a lot more complicated. And we worked out that what he had to do is he needed to just restructure what he was doing and he needed to stop doing the things that he hates doing. And it, again, like, I mean, something so simple, right? But it's had a humongous impact on his life to, to the point where the business is now more profitable. Um, he feels amazing and I'm able to to do more for him because he's more open-minded, his, his goals have expanded, he wants to do more personally. Um, and as a business owner, he just wants to grow more than ever. So if I hadn't had that discussion in that, and I hadn't stopped there for a second and be like, well, hold on a sec, we just go back to basics. What's going on here? Um, mm. None of that would have happened. And a lot of it was mindset, I think. And this is something that Baz helped me with, but mindset around, you know, it's okay to have these awkward discussions with clients. Um, if, if, if they mention something, don't just move on, stop and just push harder. If that makes sense, push on that point. If, if they mm. say, oh yeah, look, um, yeah, it works all right. It's a bit stressful. Um, instead of just brushing it off, be like, yeah, work gets like that. You probably need a holiday. And then just moving on, be like, well, hold on a sec. Why is it stressful? Um, what's what's happened recently? Um, are you happy? Do you think you probably need to go and do some study and move into something completely different? Like these are things that no one will really tell these people, especially if they're re established professionals. I mean, they're not going to listen to to people at work that tell them go find another job. Um, <laughs> so this is where we're in that position where we can do that. Yeah, interesting. And is it some? Is it a matter of like when you're working with newer clients in particular, like uh, having like a direct line of questioning around, you know, the bigger sort of questions that you mentioned, or is it just as you said there, like where if someone says something, then you do dive deeper, or is it some sort of com uh, combination? Because I know. For me, and we, we tend to get into some pretty personal type conversations, but I don't really have like an overt line of communications when we're talking to initial like clients in the initial stages specifically about that. Yeah, it's um, it's not nothing too structured. Like we don't have like a set, you know, some set questions or anything like that. But it's 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 t to me when I start off the, the appointments now, um, again, since since making these changes about a year ago, I'm, I'm just initially very explicit about what I expect of the client and what they should expect of me. 
Um, I'm very explicit that they need to be as honest as possible with me um, and that I expect that and I'm going to be as honest as possible with them so that I can help them. Um, I tell them that um, this isn't for everyone, but this is just how we do it around here. And I feel like when I do that, I then give myself permission to just ask the hard questions and to ask the awkward questions and 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 just asking things like, and again, this is all the stuff that I sort of went through with um, um, the business coach, Baz, but, you know, asking whether in three years, if we're looking back, back at this discussion, um, this is a very popular question, but in three years, what do you want, what would you have to like, what would you like to see has happened to be like, that was an awesome three years. Um, mm. a, a, an author wrote a book about that question, but just asking things yeah. like that and then figuring out where to dig if that makes sense. And then asking literally upfront yeah. questions like, are you happy in your relationship? Are you happy with your work? Do you enjoy what you do every day? Like think about it. If you stopped anyone in the street and said, Hey, are you happy with your life right now? Mm. Um, that person probably has yeah, never had question. anyone ask them that question except for their mum. <laughs> <laughs> and I was always too scared to ask these questions. Cause like, Oh crap, what do I do if they say they're not happy? You know, I, I don't want to offend them and say, Oh, you know, get a haircut. So it's, yeah. it's sort of, yeah, it's, um, it's been good. And again, I think it, cause it's in my DNA to, to talk about these things and I, I just love doing it. It's, it's just grown, um, from there. And just another actually really cool example I want to give recently is I had a client, um, he's a, um, a, a trading and he's in a situation where he worked out that he doesn't have, he's enjoying what he does, but he enjoyed it more when he didn't have his own business and, um, talking to his um, partner, she works, she does a lot of the admin side of things in the business. And we sort of worked out after talking is that she doesn't really enjoy it anymore. Like she, she doesn't like the paperwork. She hates it. And he, he dreads quoting and they thought their solution was to hire another tradie in the business to pick up the load. But just instead of just moving on, be like, yeah, you need another tradie. What do we need to do to make that happen? How much is it going to cost? What does your cash flow need to look like? I did that whole digging deeper thing. And what we literally worked out is they don't need another plumber or another electrician in the business. Um, they need an admin person, not, not, not mm. his wife, just because she's his wife, but they need an admin person that does these things that knows what they're doing. And by doing that, it means he can focus on his trade. It means that um, she can focus on her own career, which had nothing to do with the business. They would be happier. The business would probably be a lot more efficient and he'll enjoy what he does. Um, and, um, and that's what we worked out they needed and, and they're now working on that. But it was just having that discussion to just to work out that one thing. And, 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 and most advisors care about their clients. Most advisors care about these things, but they don't, I feel like they, they sort of, they, they walk around the awkward conversations or they don't dig deeper because they're just rushing to get onto the next client or the next task or, mm. or something like that. But but hey, think you know. Imagine how much energy that conversation gave me. You know, I could talk about I could talk about it to him for like ten hours if I wanted to. Mm. Do you ever get any pushback from from people uh, when you when you say you know this is the way that we do things around here? Never. I mean, I'm sure a couple don't might have some pushback and they they don't really show it. But to, to be honest with you, no one's ever had any pushback. They just most people just acknowledge that yeah, that sounds good because it's like. I'm showing them that I'm there to help them. I'm not there to judge. And it's, 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 it's powerful. Honestly, it's very, very powerful because it's, um, again, it means I'm, I'm getting permission um, from them. And, and secondly, yeah. it means that I'm personally setting that expectation for myself where it's like, okay, mm. now I have to ask the questions because I've told them I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I think that as, you know, technology develops more to do more of the sort of, the basics of of what financial planners historically have done that it is really you know what people are uh, wanting and should be looking for and why they should pay an advisor instead of just using some tech platform is to have someone that understands them deeply and make sure that they're shaping their financial decisions around that appropriately so uh yeah i think you you're certainly you know right in the wave of the future uh when it when it comes to that as well so it's great to see yeah. Um, thank you. Interested to know how that question goes with, um, are you happy in your relationship with the couples? Do you do that while they're both in the same room or? Uh, so, sometimes. Um, if, if, if I could see that there's, <laughs> there's a bit of conflict, like, is there, you know, is there, is there, are you both happy in your relationship? Is, is, because not, again, as you know, with money, 
that there's things, you know, one person's could be yeah. a saver, one person's a spender. And you can sometimes yeah. see that you could sort yeah. of feel that tension in the room sometimes. Yeah. Um, and just asking as in like, Hey, is everything, but yeah, not obviously trying to <laughs> hook them up with someone else or anything like that. <laughs> nice. Uh, mate, thank you so much for sharing your story. My my last question for you is is to say if you could go back to yourself, you know, five or so years ago when you're about to uh, you know kick off the business and give yourself give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? It would be to work with people that give me energy, not people that suck my energy. That's what it would be. It would be work to to, to not just take on a client just because I have to take on a client or because they want me to become their advisor, but just working with people that bring me joy. And I think that would have made life a lot easier for me and a few clients as well, to, to be honest with you. Um, I've never had any sour or bad relationship with any client at all, um, but it's normally very obvious when there's a good fit and when there's not a good fit. Um, mm. And and I think and I heard, I heard this years ago from someone, but it's the clients that you don't take on that define your success. And and again, not that I've had any bad clients. I can't, I can't say I've got a single client who I regret taking on, but they're, if I had focused more on the clients that I love working with um, and those that give me energy and those that bring me joy, um, I, I think I would have defined a lot more as to what type of advisor I want to be and what type of practice I want to have as well. Mate, I love it. Wise words. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's so much learning, especially when you you know, common story, you start your business because you love advice and you, you're good at advice and there's a few things that you want to do differently, but there's so much stuff to learn. So uh, the key is that you are learning and, and uh, growing, but absolutely, you know, um, making sure that any client that you, someone told me that you, if you ever regret jumping or not regret, but like, um, you know, don't feel really good about jumping into a meeting with someone, then they're probably not the right fit for you and you're probably not the right fit for them. So yeah, love hearing that and and definitely wise words. Uh, that, that's it. And, and as I said to you when we were talking earlier, like it, it sounds like the perfect business. It's definitely not. And it's in every week, it's literally just about improving and about trying to work out what I can do differently, what I can do better and how we can help more people. Mate, I love it. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for, for sharing your story, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, keep, keep doing your great work. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Likewise.